Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics Election 2020 Fall Discussion Group. This is the sixth week in our seven part series, Politics, Pandemic and Protests. This fall, we're gathering virtually on Wednesday afternoons to explore the 2020 presidential campaign and the larger political landscape. I'm Colleen McCain Nelson, and I'm a fellow at KU's Dole Institute of Politics. I'm also vice president and editorial page editor at the Kansas City Star. And before coming back home to Kansas, I was a White House correspondent and a political reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Today's conversation will tackle an issue that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about in, in my current role. We'll endeavor to answer the question, do endorsements matter? And for decades, newspaper endorsements were a boost for campaigns, but in an era of multiplying media outlets and declining newspaper subscriptions, it's worth asking the question, do endorsements still carry the same weight? In 2016, Donald Trump earned the endorsements of only 20 daily newspapers in the entire country, but he won the White House. Today, we're convening opinion journalists to explore what role editorial boards are playing in the 2020 election and to consider the question of whether traditional candidate endorsements have outlived their usefulness. Before I introduce you to our guests, I do want to mention that we plan to make this an interactive conversation. I have questions for our panelists, but I want to give everyone watching a chance to participate as well. So later in the discussion, we will leave some time for our audience to ask questions. And if you have a question, please type it in the YouTube chat box on your screen. If you could hold questions until a little bit later in the program, I'll let you know when we're ready to have you start typing. And just a reminder that the Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. So please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. Finally, before we move on to the program, I want to thank Newman's Own Foundation, which is sponsoring this series. Okay, let's get started. We have an excellent lineup today and I'm eager to introduce you to today's guests, two opinion editors who I'm fortunate to work with in the McClatchy Company and who can share their unique experiences with candidate endorsements. Peter St. Ange is the North Carolina opinion editor and editorial page editor for the Charlotte Observer and Raleigh News and Observer. He has been with the Observer since 1999 and he has worked in most every corner of the newsroom. He was a member of the Sold and Nightmare team that that was a public service Pulitzer finalist and has appeared twice in the American Society of Newspaper Editors annual best newspaper writing book for short features and deadline news features. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Colleen, glad to be here. Ryan J. Rusak is the opinion editor of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. He writes and oversees content that includes editorials, opinion columns, and guest op-eds. He was previ previously the politics editor of the Dallas Morning News, where I got to work with Ryan also, uh, where he oversaw campaign and government coverage from Dallas, Austin, and Washington for more than a decade. He's a graduate of Texas Christian University. Welcome, Ryan, and thanks for joining us. Thanks. Good to be here. So let's jump right in. I want to start with kind of a primer on endorsements. I think you know the readers of our publications know generally what a candidate endorsement is, but they don't necessarily know exactly how it came about. And different news organizations have different standards. I'm interested in how each of you approach endorsements. Some readers seem to think that we're just kind of spouting opinions off the top of our heads or just going with our gut when we say that Bob Jones is the best candidate in this race. But I know for the two of you, this process entails a lot more than just contemplating which candidate you like. Um, so Ryan, why don't we start with you? What goes into an endorsement? Well, I, I would say that to, to your point about um, forming an opinion, the thing that goes into it is is reporting, and that and that is a long process that involves paying attention to issues that matter uh, for the for the you're, you're going to endorse it, be it local, be it state, uh, be it uh, even at the congressional level, um, and then specifically for an endorsement, it involves it involves trying to uh, get an interview with the candidates. Um, most candidates are are still eager to participate. Uh, we always do have a few holdouts um, and sometimes scheduling is, uh, is an issue, but for the most part, they participate. Um, and, and what we're looking for in our interviews is, is a sense of uh, mission, what the candidate hopes to accomplish, uh, their level of experience, uh, their facility with the issues, um, their specific proposals and their understanding of how they would function in the job that they're 
that they're running for. And, and that's particularly important if it's say a, a, a someone who would be a, a newcomer to a legislator or, or to Congress where they wouldn't have as much power as, as say a veteran lawmaker. We try to get a sense of what in their past and their temperament would, would make them uh, qualify. And then as, a, uh, as an editorial board, we discuss um, uh, the, the interviews and the candidates and the other research that we've done uh, and the issues that are most important that we wanna focus on in those endorsements. Um, and then we, uh, we make a call and we generally try to just be as persuasive as we can and argue uh, uh, why someone you know, deserves the spot and uh, honestly, whether the other person does or doesn't, um, but just doesn't measure up to the person that we endorse. And Peter, what goes into an endorsement on, on your team? So really much of the same things that Ryan mentioned. We uh, offer an interview to all candidates that are on the ballot and, and most every one of them take us up on it. Um, and we talk to them about some of the same things that Ryan mentioned. We talk about vision. Um, we want to get a sense of their sophistication around issues, uh, how much they grasp what the role is in, in the office and, and how much they grasp um, the 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 influence they have over, over the issues that they're speaking about. Um, one of the things that we also do is we spend a good bit of time talking to other people about the candidates, and that's especially true in judicial races. Um, we you know, want to know how, they, how judges operate in their courtroom, um, how attorneys are seen by other attorneys and judges in, 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 uh, in Raleigh and in Charlotte. And so that, that informs us in a different sort of way about candidates when we hear uh, not only what they think about themselves, but what others think about them. So uh, just like Ryan says, we uh, take those discussions and back to the board as a whole. And, and we talk about uh, what we think, uh, which candidates share the values of the editorial board, but also which candidates uh, most represent the values of their districts, which is uh, it's just kind of a thumb on the scale for us. Uh, if we have a, a candidate that's a more conservative candidate than the editorial board, but uh, fits the values of, of his or her district, then, then that's something we're gonna consider. Um, so yeah, a lot of reporting goes into it and that's, that's kind of the foundation for us. Right. Well, and, and I want to talk more about the reporting that you all do in local endorsements. We'll get to presidential endorsements later in the conversation, but let's let's stick with local for a little while. And, you know, we hear from a lot of readers when we do endorsements and um, some of them have asked, you know, why do you do endorsements at all? And I get a fair number of emails that have kind of a how dare you vibe. And, uh, and some readers say, you know, just cover the news. Don't tell me how to vote. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll ask you, why not just let voters make up their own minds? Our, our newspapers already publish a voter guide with info about all the candidates. We do cover the news. Um, Peter, why not just send people to the voter guide and let them decide for themselves? You know, I, I think that, you know, much like all of our editorials, we see ourselves as having a voice in community discussions. So when we're doing an endorsement, we've said this often to readers, we're not telling readers how to vote. Um, we're telling readers what we think about candidates and we trust them to use that information the same way they would a voter guide and, and then come to their own decisions. So for us, it's it's having a having a voice, um, having an opinion. When we when we write an endorsement, we're not saying we think that this is the best candidate. We're saying we think that this is we here is why we think a candidate is good for that district. So for us, you know, we we see it as consistent with our role in general as a, as an editorial board. We we take issues uh, that the community is talking about and we give our perspective on it. We're one voice of many, and we feel that our endorsements are the same sort of thing. And, and Ryan, how, how dare you? Why not, why not just let voters decide for themselves? <laughs> well, I think Peter, Peter put it pretty well. It's, it's a, a matter of uh, uh, similar to everything that we write. If, if, if we're, we're writing about uh, uh, suggesting that the city council should do or not do something, um, you know, it, it, would, it would be perfectly appropriate for the city council member to say, who the heck are you? Um, I recently had a, this very conversation with a reader, a uh, subscriber who was just um, sort of exasperated that we were doing them at all. Um, and and I, I finally told her, uh, and I don't say this often, I said, you know, you don't have to read them. You don't even have to read them. You can just turn the page. I said, but there are a lot of people who have expressed their appreciation for our uh, homework, the level of, of care that we put into it. And Particularly the further down the ballot you go, um, you know, this year in particular, we have a, a case where because so many local elections were delayed in Texas, 
uh, and I'm sure in other states as well, uh, our ballot goes everywhere from president to school board in, in some of our suburban counties. And so if you get down that ballot, it's a, a lot harder for people to, um, to uh, do any serious evaluation of those candidates. And, and we just offer our perspective, um, our, our informed, and I always tell people, uh, you know, I, I, if you does something for you, great. I hope we were helpful. If not, we'll write about other things before long. So I, I think that endorsements also kind of surface some of readers' general confusion about how newspapers work and, you know, where the lines are drawn. And, you know, these have been, these, the, this confusion has been exacerbated as, as things have moved more and more online. And I think, you know, the, the roadmap for reading the newspaper was a lot clearer when you held the newspaper uh, than it is when you go online and, and just um, and either go to our website or just encounter articles out in the, you know, the wild west of, of Facebook or Google. Um, so I'm interested, Ryan, whether you think that readers understand the difference between the news side and the editorial board and, and do endorsements add to that confusion and, and what should we be doing to try to help clarify how we all do our jobs? Yeah, I, I think that uh, a support of readers do, particularly if they were readers of the print edition for the long time. For a long time, I do worry that in the digital uh, era, it's not only hard for them to distinguish us from uh, outlets that that are maybe uh, partisan or ideological, um, but they also have trouble distinguishing our. Uh, work as editorial writers uh, with the work of the newsroom, which still aims to be uh, uh, objective. Um, uh, I think that there's a, I think we could do a better job in terms of labeling and presentation. And, and uh, one of the things we've tried to do recently for the whole Star Telegram newsroom, but um, I've been a part of it is, is just get it out into the community. Obviously COVID has had a, a, a bad effect on that, but just sort of get out to community leaders and community groups and explain who we are and what we're trying to do and what the differences are uh, so that hopefully we can we can help them understand the, what the mission of the editorial page is. But I do think that that knowledge, that civic uh, understanding, if you will, has probably. And, and Peter, what do, what do you think? Um, are readers confused by endorsements? You know, I, I think that readers are confused um, about the editorial board and the separation with the newsroom all year round. And I think I probably say a little bit more of it with endorsements than I do with regular editorials. I think that's because endorsements, um, I think newspapers uh, historically have had Metro columnists who write opinion in the news section and, and people see the editorial board as, as somewhat of an extension of that. But endorsements are something different than any, anyone else in the newsroom uh, does. So I see a little bit more of that confusion. Um, we try to do a little bit of educating um, on that. We, we have, uh, before we even begin our endorsements, I usually write kind of a kickoff editorial in which I explain what endorsements are and what the editorial board is. Um, and then with each endorsement, we have a what's called a background card down at the bottom of it in which we explain what the editorial board is and how endorsements happen and those sorts of things. Um, and I think that probably helps. But I do think that, especially in the digital age, as people see an endorsement just kind of pop up as opposed to the print age where you where the endorsements always landed on that opinion page, which was separate from from the news pages, usually in the back of the, the front A section. Um, and it was easier to kind of, you know, visualize the separation from the rest of the newsroom. So it's a little bit more challenging now. And I agree with Ryan. I think we just have to keep trying to do a better job of, of educating folks on it. We will keep working on that. Absolutely, it's it, and it's it, we explain that over and over again, um, but we really can't explain it enough. And uh, there, and there's no such thing as as too much transparency. I would I would say in this process. Um, so I also hear a lot from readers what I would describe as taunting when <laughs> we endorse a candidate who ultimately loses, and um, and they tell me, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. If you knew anything about politics, you would have known that this candidate was going to lose. Uh, and so I find myself explaining a lot. You know, here's the thing: we're not trying to predict the winner um, based on polling and our on and our own reporting. We do have a pretty good sense of what's likely to happen on election day. Um, so we're not trying to handicap the race, but we're trying to provide readers with insights that we can about who we think is best prepared to do this job. Um, 
Peter, I'm interested in in just kind of what different considerations you're you're making uh, as you consider an a, an endorsement. Uh, you know, are are you thinking, well, gosh, this guy is going to get slaughtered? Should we really endorse him? Are you thinking people are going to be angry if we in, endorse her, and they're going, I'm going to have an inbox full of angry emails? Or you know, tell me all the considerations that uh, that you're contemplating as you decide whom to endorse. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think it's kind of human nature. You don't want to make a pick that people are going to to ridicule. Um, you don't want to. You don't necessarily want to make a pick that people are going to to be angry about. Um, so we try to push all that aside as much as possible. Um, you know, we generally um, we don't endorse unserious candidates because they're uh, because they are in fact unserious and, and don't, wouldn't necessarily make for the best candidate and make for the best public official. So for us, the criteria is, you know, do they, the things that we spoke about before, you know, do they share our values? Do they have a, a grasp of what the job is? Do they have the same vision for the job um, or vision for their, their county or city or state, um, something that we share? Or do they have the, the sense of values that really matches well with their district? So in that case, you know, we are a, a center left editorial board um, and would, um, if we were just picking candidates who had, who shared our values, we'd probably pick a whole lot uh, of Democrats and we do pick a whole lot of Democrats. But um, when we are picking for a conservative County Commission District in in uh, Mecklenburg County, which is uh, the county that Charlotte is is in, you know, we will think about um, do, does this candidate uh, positions on issues, do the candidates' values match the voters in that county? And it, and if so, that's something that we will say in the editorial in the endorsement. We'll say, you know, this, you know, we might not agree with this candidate on, on all issues, but this candidate would represent the the voters of that district really well. So those are the things that are always our criteria. The other stuff, you know, are people going to get mad? You know, well, we'll probably think about it a little bit, but we try to push it aside. And, and Ryan, I'm interested in how you weigh all this. And I think we've probably all had the experience of, of interviewing a candidate um, when we agree with their positions, um, but they're not very polished or they don't, you know, have a depth of knowledge that we were hoping for. Um, you know, there are a lot of imperfect candidates. And, uh, and so how, how do you kind of weigh, you know, experience versus I agree with this guy versus this guy's sure. really slick and, and comes across really well? Uh, yeah, I, I think Peter is on to a, a good point there is that you, the first thing is to try to, to um, represent the electorate that this candidate is, is trying to reach out for. And, and um, uh, the way districts are drawn now in, in, at so many levels, uh, it's pretty clear what the intent of that district uh, uh, was meant to be. And so you can sort of put yourself in those shoes. Um, I, I, we tend to... Uh, I would describe us as almost perfectly down the middle, maybe leaning just a hair to the right, but but we're pretty moderate. We're pretty business focused. Uh, uh, we like candidates who who you know uh, are there to get work done and not um, uh, not try to gum up the works necessarily. Um, and so we we try to look at their record to figure out if there's something there that indicates that that's the kind of, of office holder they would be. Whether they've been in politics or not, you can tell if someone is a facilitator based on their civic involvement, uh, based on their their uh, uh, business. Uh, you know, we obviously we see a lot of lawyers, we see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, real estate types, the types that tend to, to have their own business and can, and can run for office. Um, and so we try to, we try to, and this is where it's really helpful, as I think Peter mentioned earlier, to talk to people, you know, in the community and people who know these candidates, because you can get a sense for how they operate. Um, uh, and you can get a feel for how seriously they're taking it. Um, you know, if you have a, a, an incumbent, odds are they're going to be, you know, they're going to have much more facility with the issues. But if the challenger comes in and has clearly anticipated your questions and has thought about the going to ask about because we don't we don't generally try to uh, uh, to uh, spring a surprise on on anybody necessarily we you know, we're, we're going to ask about the biggest issues that that governing body is going to face and so you can tell pretty quickly if someone has the has done the work and and work what they with us and and so Peter you talked a little bit about trying to set your own um, 
kind of politics aside or your own views aside and, and choose candidates uh, who represent uh, the areas that, uh, that, that you know, represent the, their constituents and, and, and the views of that particular area. But we still hear from readers who say, you know, well, you're just all Democrats. So of course you're going to endorse that candidate or, or, or you're a Republican. So of course you endorsed um, that candidate. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what you say to those readers and, and just kind of how you explain your own worldview to them. <laughs> You know, that's, a, that's interesting because I, I, I've had that conversation with uh, a couple of readers in the last few days. And um, and I will say, you know, we're, as I said to you, we're a center left editorial board. Um, and when we write our editorials, those that's kind of generally the, the perspective that appears in our editorials. And so we are going to probably, if, if uh, everything else being equal and a competitive district, we are probably going to endorse a candidate who is, um, who is a moderate and perhaps a little bit left of moderate, um, and and I want to be honest and transparent about that. You know, our editorial page, our editorials are what they are. What we try to offer on our pages is the opportunity for other perspectives in different parts of our pages. So, so with endorsements, you know, yeah, I mean, we're probably going to endorse more Democrats. Um, that's probably happened more in the in the past few years, um, both in Charlotte and in Raleigh, which have become. Uh, significantly bluer, um, uh, both the city and the county. Um, and, and that changes um, the, the types of candidates who run for city and county elections. Uh, used to be we had a whole lot more conservative districts where we could you know, endorse a, a Republican in a district that, that's, a, that's a redder district. But now even those redder districts are much more competitive um, and it makes it much uh, more challenging to just say, oh, that's the Republican, he or she is gonna reflect the views of the district. Um, you know, now that, that's even more challenging. What we don't do is, is, is we don't, don't have quotas. We don't. Um, we're not going to endorse a Republican. Um, we're going to, you know, look for opportunities um, that we we believe a, a county commission shouldn't be an all Democratic county commission, even in a in a blue county, and a city council shouldn't be a all uh, Democrat city council. Um, so we what we do is value dissenting voices, and and we will say so in our endorsements. What we think is the most important thing of all is. Uh, to just tell people what we think. So we en endorsed the Republican on an all Democrat county commission, for example, last week. And we said, the Democrat is a fine candidate. The Republican is a fine candidate, but this commission needs dissenting voices and it needs to not be um, unanimous, uh, needs to not be a 9-0 Democratic uh, majority. So we endorsed the Republican in that race. For us, it's just important to just kind of say what the reason is and not try to hide behind any sort of quota. And Ryan, how do you explain your worldview to, to readers? And and um, and also, you're negotiating this with with other members of the editorial board, and and maybe you could talk a, a little bit about that as well. Sure. So so I've been in this job for about a year and a half, and and one of my challenges has probably been uh, convincing readers who have been skeptical of the Star Telegram as as being very liberal that that I am not, and that the board is not. I I lean sort of right, uh, libertarian-ish, and I'm not, uh, I wouldn't call myself part of the, the, the Trump right, um, whatever that turns out to be as that continues to evolve, but traditionally, you know, more conservative uh, than not. And um, I just do, traded emails with a guy yesterday who, who we endorsed a Democrat in a house race. And, you know, he, he said, oh, of course, I don't even have to read this. I know what you liberals have, have uh, have done and I said, well, here's our endorsement of our Republican senator. Here's our our looking for Congress. Here's an endorsement for a Republican for uh, in a different district. And by the way, here's a column that I wrote about you know how dangerous socialism is and it's, et cetera, et cetera. Just to try to um, to try to educate um, and hopefully win some people over that that it, they're not necessarily the the, the straight dose of one party or the other that they expect. Um, I, I think the other thing is, um, uh, you really nailed it, is, is it, it, it's not just endorsing someone based on their positions. And where do you stand? Do we agree? I mean, that's, that's not journalism. That's all. It's about judgment. It's about what the body needs. Uh, you know, uh, having balance, having dissenting voices, as Peter mentioned, and it's about what that district may need. And it may be about um, 
you know, leadership skills, or it may be about um, uh, um, a perspective that that person can bring to that governing body where we say all other things being equal, we think that's an important factor and factor that in. And the other thing I tell people is when they, you know, if I get an email that, uh, uh, or a call where someone says, how could you endorse so-and-so? I, I tell them, I just spent 700 words explaining it. I'm happy to talk about it with you, but we don't, we don't just say we're endorsing so-and-so, that's it. We make an argument. We, we try to build a case and we try to acknowledge the arguments against that person or the arguments for their opponent. Um, and sometimes they're good arguments. Sometimes we say, uh, I, I just published one today where I said, honestly, either of these candidates would be a really good state representative. Here's who we favor and here's why. Um, and so I, I, I think trying to, it sounds sort of obvious for an opinion writer, but trying to be as persuasive as you can, particularly to people who you think are inclined to disagree with your recommendation is useful because at least then you've laid out a case and it's not, you know, they, if a reader is thinking that you're just knee jerk uh, endorsing based on party or, or certain issues or certain um, affiliations, you can, you can demonstrate that that's not true. So I thought you both would be great for this conversation for a number of reasons, but one of them was that you you both had to contend with some notable news and kind of surprise twists and turns as, as you embarked on making endorsements in your US Senate races. And so I wanted to talk about those races for a minute. Um, let's start with North Carolina. Peter, you have Tom Tillis, a Republican incumbent running against Cal Cunningham, the Democratic challenger in North Carolina. You invited the candidates to interview, you wrote an endorsement, and then something happened. <laughs> and so why don't you talk to us a little bit about the endorsement process in, in your Senate race? Sure. So um, we did invite both candidates in for, for a video discussion. Um, uh, the Republican Tom Tillis um, uh, did not respond to those requests. We, we requested a few times. Uh, the Democrat Cal Cunningham did. Um, uh, we were prepared to uh, endorse um, Cal Cunningham a few Sundays ago um, and uh, even had the, the uh, endorsement written and, and it was uh, close to being published uh, when we learned that um, he had uh, news broke that he had exchanged uh, sexual text messages with someone who was not his wife um, and uh, subsequently learned that he um, probably um, was engaged in an affair as well. So. We pulled that endorsement um, um, and uh, talked about it as a board for quite some time. Um, not, not just about um, the, the sexual messages, but his response to it. So what was important to us was that he subsequently kind of went into hiding a little bit. Um, didn't want to answer questions about, uh, about not only the sex me sexual messages, but uh, questions that we had about uh, whether campaign funds were used in, in any visits that he might have had, uh, was this part of a pattern? And so we were troubled not only by the judgment that he showed, but, um, but his response to it. Uh, so we had an interesting discussion as an editorial board. Uh, some of the members of our board thought that um, this was more a race about um, control of the Senate than it was about Cal Cunningham uh, or Tom Tillis and, and wanted uh, to endorse um, Cal Cunningham anyway. Uh, some of us thought that uh, we hold public officials to standards, um, not even standards in terms of uh, morality, but in terms of leadership and, um, and what they do when difficult moments uh, uh, come across their desk uh, and, and, and controversies. Uh, and we don't want to abandon those standards just for an endorsement. Uh, so what's interesting is, is that's quite a gap for an editorial board. This wasn't just a matter of kind of hashing out issues or, or where a candidate stood on issues. This is kind of really two kind of polar positions here that we had. Um, and so what we did was we wrote a, a, an editorial, uh, not an endorsement editorial because we didn't endorse either candidate. And we explained to readers that, um, that members of the board felt uh, that we should endorse and members of the board felt that we shouldn't um, and that because we couldn't uh, come to a consensus that we weren't going to issue an endorsement in that race. And it's interesting because I, I expected some real pushback about that. Uh, and, and we did get some, a few letters, um, a couple of phone calls, but, uh, but got far more from folks who appreciated that we just kind of laid it all out there for them and, and were transparent about our process and what we thought um, and and it, you know when we when we couldn't come to a, a, a firm place that we just kind of told them, told readers that that's where we were. Um, and I think there may be a lesson in that, you know, not for endorsements necessarily, but for for other things that we do. But it was interesting for sure. 
indeed and that's that's such a tough call because obviously the object you know you go into this the objective is to make an endorsement and um, it, it certainly feels a, a little bit un, unsatisfying to not make an endorsement um, but as you as you say it was a divided board a really tough call um, this is perhaps an unfair follow-up question um, and and speculative of course but you did come within a hair's breadth of, of you know publishing endorsement and then having this you know this could have happened a, a day later or two days later, what, what happens in that scenario? Is, is it possible to have a do-over? Is it possible to take it back? Or would you want to? Um, you know, what if, what if the endorsement had already been published? You know, it's a great question. And I think we all have these rules in our mind about endorsements and what, what, you know, what, what are the rules there, but there really are none. I mean, you know, we, we, if the, if the allegations would have been, you know, serious enough, um, do we pull an endorsement because somebody had an affair? We really have to talk about that. If it were a more serious allegation, would we pull an endorsement? Well, I think that, you know, there probably is, a, you know, something, a candidate who we endorse can do something wrong enough that we would decide that that candidate, you know, that we know more about that candidate now and can no longer support that candidate in a race. Um, I, I'm not sure if we would have done that I think we we might have, depending if he would have responded the same way, perhaps we would have written the, the same non-endorsement editorial that we ultimately wrote. Um, but you know, I, I can't promise that's the case. So when something <laughs> happens post, it makes things a whole lot more difficult than when something happens before. As I said, probably an unfair question. <laughs> so, uh, so Ryan, in, in Texas, you have Republican incumbent John Cornyn running against Democratic challenger MJ Hagar in the in the Senate race there. Uh, both candidates interviewed with you and John Cornyn made some notable news in his meeting with your editorial board. I'm interested in, in the story of the sequence of events there. Uh, sure, so, uh, and this is a good example of a, of a thing that, that uh, Peter and I have talked about of, of, of where just a straight sort of ideological, do you match us on issues doesn't quite, it uh, doesn't always, uh, uh, it isn't always sufficient. Um, so we were the last major uh, editorial board in Texas to interview uh, Senator Cornyn. Uh, uh, so we had a sense of you know what he was saying as he went into some of these boards. But I asked him, uh, I asked him whether he had any regrets about the way that he had responded to the president. Um, uh, and he told us in some colorful language that, uh, that he had, there were instances where he had uh, privately taken disagreements to the president because because President Trump is is not someone who it's productive to to you know sort of call out in uh, uh, in public. And he and he mentioned the the uh, circumstances of his of his friend, former Tennessee Republican Senator Bob Corker, uh, who tried the other way early on in the Trump administration and and soon found his political career uh, ended. Um, voluntarily, but because the writing was probably on the wall for Corker. So, uh, so it was interesting. Uh, and frankly, I, I knew it was noteworthy. Um, I, I did not expect that when a reporter who a newsroom reporter who sat in wrote the story, uh, and led with that made that the main topic of the story, he, uh, uh, it made huge national news. Um, and part of it was just the timing, I think, because we were coming around to the point where uh, the polls were looking bad for the president and there was some question about whether Republicans might try to distance themselves and, and save, save their Senate majority. Uh, and that appeared to be what, uh, what Cornyn had done uh, in a way that I don't know that he had ever uh, said that before. And it did turn out that on a couple of the, uh, a couple of the points that he said he disagreed with the president on, you know, we followed up and asked what they were. And it turns out there were a couple where he had, if he took that concern to the president privately, he never betrayed it in public because he even voted uh, a certain way, basically on the president's side. Uh, so by the time we got around to writing an editorial, um, um, we, we had to deal with this, this news and the reaction to it. Um, and this is where, again, I think sometimes readers, you can surprise readers if they, maybe they don't, they think you're gonna go a certain way for sure. Um, we actually, you know, said we didn't love the, some of the, the um, duplicity in what Corrin said, but that, we, we, that he was right, that he had done the best possible thing to try to um, uh, sway the president and move the president um, by not 
you know, running to the nearest microphone and, and criticizing uh, the president on these issues. So uh, that that had been, you know, it may not be what everybody wants to see in their senator, but that it had been a, a, as effective as he probably could have been in the moment. So um, it was interesting how how quickly the, uh, the the this comment and this one moment from Cornyn, and he's been a he's been our senator for eighteen years, so you know we 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 know his tendencies for better or worse. Um, and I give him credit because he he's generally pretty responsive to the press. Um, uh, and it just became this moment of of that illustrated the larger picture for people uh, uh, in which uh, they were trying to figure out exactly what was going on with that level of the campaign. Well, and Ryan, I think that speaks to the question of, of whether endorsements matter, because, you know, we wouldn't he have heard this from Cornyn, perhaps, if, if not for, for you all doing this endorsement interview with him. And, and increasingly, it seems like a lot of candidates are making the decision to avoid debates or do fewer debates, to avoid tough questions, um, to primarily communicate with voters through ads and in friendly confines. And so endorsement interviews are one of the few opportunities to ask candidates tough questions in, in some cases. Um, so Ryan, I'm interested in what you think we would lose out on if we weren't doing endorsements and we weren't doing these interviews. Uh, that's, a, that's probably the chief thing, um, particularly for a, an office holder who's been around a while and you're, and you're trying to, to uh, figure out you know, where they stand in terms of, of their effectiveness. Um, uh, if we didn't have those, uh, you know, he sat with us for an hour. Uh, uh, or nearly an hour, and so did MJ Hagar in a separate interview. And and um, you know, I don't know that any Texas campaign journalist would have had the 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 time or the or the access to uh, to sit down with him uh, that long and talk about uh, health care and the border and relations with Mexico and you you know some things that the president, some things that you know, if it's not sometimes if it's not news of the moment, it's hard to get into. And so we try to make ours uh, fairly wide ranging. Um, uh, it would be a tremendous loss, I think, for for uh, readers because um, our our job, whatever whoever we endorse and however we we approach this, our number one goal is to hold office holders accountable. We want to um, we want to ask them about their actions or their intended actions. We want to to put them in scenarios. Uh, in which they may have to respond uh, as an office holder. And we want to, to uh, if they've taken an action that may be controversial, we want to give them a chance to explain it and we want to be able to press them on it. And, and you can only really do that in a long interview. You can't do that in a, uh, if a bunch of reporters are, are gathered around uh, a senator on Capitol Hill, for instance. It's just too, you know, it's too frenetic. Um, so, so these interviews on behalf of the readers, I think, are really important because we do get a chance to, to really dig into some things that wouldn't otherwise come up. And Peter, you noted that um, Tom Tillis declined um, to sit for an interview. Uh, I think we all in, in doing these candid interviews had that experience that, that some candidates just flat out won't talk to us. Um, in, in some places that number seems to be growing, um, even though most candidates are, are still saying yes, some are, some are saying no and, and kind of testing the question of <laughs> what if I just opt out and, um, and just stick to uh, friendly environments. Um, and I'm interested in why you think that is and, and whether you're concerned that increasingly candidates will just stop showing up. I, I do worry about that a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, Tom Tillis was one of a few who, who didn't um, who didn't interview with us. Uh, I, I think that what Ryan says is really important is that uh, what, what we're doing is giving them an opportunity to state their case and, and to voters. Uh, I think the questions that we ask, the way we approach those interviews show that, you know, we're willing to, to and really want to treat uh, all candidates fairly and, and discuss issues and, and not discuss the opinions of the editorial board, but let them really make that case. So I do think it's, a, it's, it's valuable to them. I think as, uh, 
the more that we do videos now, video interviews are, are something that uh, is kind of a, a newer phenomenon for, for us uh, in Charlotte and in Raleigh. And I think that as candidates see those interviews, they'll probably recognize, I hope that they'll recognize that this is something that, that serves them as well as, uh, as well as it serves readers. You know, the other thing that I think is important to us is that when we make our endorsements, that we uh, explain that we give candidates um, voice in those endorsements to even candidates that we don't endorse. We don't use our endorsements and never have as a place to say we really love one candidate and really don't like another one. What we do is talk about what each candidate offers and give, give their perspective a chance on our pages and then say what we prefer in a candidate or, or what we think about a candidate. And that, uh, I, I think that that has helped us get more interviews uh, and, and very few candidates decline interviews with us because I think that they I hope that they trust us to, to just give, let them make their case, even if we're not going to endorse them. So I want to switch gears now and, and talk about presidential endorsements. And um, in, in our company, we're, at each of our newspapers, we're, we're focused on local opinion journalism. And we're also focused on doing endorsements in races where we've interviewed the candidates. And so um, we didn't make endorsements in the presidential election this year. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts about those presidential endorsements um, for so long. Um, it was, it, pretty much every newspaper in America felt obligated to weigh in on every presidential election. We see that changing somewhat now. Um, a number of newspapers have just made the same decision this year to, to not do presidential endorsements. But Peter, I'm interested in what you think presidential endorsements accomplish um, and what perhaps has changed to compel some newspapers to take a pass on that. You know, to me, this is the one of the most interesting topics because I really do waver on this. Uh, uh, I, I understand why we don't do presidential endorsements. Um, you know, we're, we primarily, primarily write editorials about local issues um, and, the, and the presidential uh, race is, is, although it of course affects um, North Carolinians and Charlotteans and people from Raleigh, um, it's, it's, gener it's a national race um, and readers and our, our voice would be one of a million voices out there. Um, so we have mo more impact on local issues um, and, and that's why we tend to write about it. Also understand that our presidential endorsement is probably the most predictable endorsement that we will make. Readers know exactly where we're going to go on, on this particular presidential race. Not all of them, but this one they would. Um, and so there's a little bit less value in that. But for me, you know, we always write about, um, about, we write about national issues and how they affect North Carolina. We write about predictable things. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, we we have written several um, editorials about Obamacare and 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 the need to strengthen it, and and uh, and and people understand that that's our position. But our our task is to to say things in a compelling way, to say new things about old issues, and I think that we can we can do that with a presidential endorsement um, as well. And finally, I, I, you know, we, we write about things that readers are talking about. And right now, readers are talking about the presidential endorsement. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, have, a, have an itch to, to want to say something about that, even though I understand all the reasons why we wouldn't. So I am firmly on the fence on this one. <laughs> Ryan, what, what do you think? Um, I, I uh, as you know, of course, Colleen, I was an editor for four presidential uh, uh, campaign cycles, including uh, 2016, um, at, a, at a paper, the, the Morning News, that, that where we really did cover uh, national, um, uh, national politics uh, still and traveled with the candidates and things like that. Uh, but I, so, so I, on the one hand, of course, I'm highly interested in presidential politics and I, and I follow it and I'm, I'm uh, a junkie about it, frankly. But uh, I've asked myself repeatedly, is there anything, anything at all that I could say that would either be unique or, or even different enough or all that persuasive in a race where um, a, a polarized country is even further sort of dug into their camps about what they think about these particular candidates. Um, and, and I couldn't come up with anything. And, and maybe that's a limit of my creativity. I don't know. But uh, I, I have a limited amount of time that I can devote to these, to these uh, races. And I mentioned earlier, we've got a long ballot full of names that people have never heard of. And so I believe where I can be most useful to, to our readers is to help them with the other stuff that's not so clear. You know, the state house races where 
uh, yeah, there's a there's an R and a D, and if you're if you tend to identify with one of those parties, you you more or less probably have your mind made up. But if you, particularly, you know, we we try to focus a lot on open seats, a seat where there's not an incumbent, because incumbency is powerful, and once somebody gets elected, uh, that they're they're pretty likely to stay there. So it's really important that the voters uh, focus in on those races when they're open, and and if I can take do more of those. Uh, in exchange for a presidential endorsement where I'm, where I'm not going to, I'm really not going to have any effect on anybody's thinking, uh, I think, um, that, then to me, that's, that's a trade-off worth making. Um, I, I believe that in, in a, the big picture of what journalism looks like right now is that um, newspapers that used to do everything, uh, you know, national, international, state, local, feature sports, you know, you name it, recipes, the crossword puzzle. There's still a, a place for that, but we're going to have to really focus in. And the national news needs to be the national news. And as Peter said, we're, we're, that doesn't mean we don't ever write about national issues. Of course we do, um, particularly as they affect Texans and, and residents of Tarrant County. Um, but we have to specialize. We have to localize. Um, because if we try to give people the same thing that they're getting in 15 other places, that they, they don't have a lot of use for us. And so if we want to be useful and relevant in our communities, I think uh, as much as it pains me, because I do like, you know, playing on the big stage, so to speak, uh, I think we have to focus locally. So in the 2016 election, 243 daily newspapers endorsed Hillary Clinton, about 20 endorsed Donald Trump. Um, the total for Clinton was about 500 endorsements when you included weekly papers and magazines and other non-daily publications. Obviously, Donald Trump is our president, despite the very strong recommendations of all but a few newspapers in the entire country. Um, I think it's worth repeating again, they were not trying to predict a winner necessarily, but we're trying to make recommendations based on, on their board's policy positions and research and, and views. Um, Ryan, I think there are a lot of different things that you could take from that, whether you know it's that all newspaper editorial boards are, are too similar in their views or um, that presidential endorsements didn't have much impact. Um, you could argue, a number of different points. I'm, I'm interested in what you take away from um, those numbers from 2016, and number even more stark this time around, but we, we don't know what the result will be. We, we know that the numbers were extremely stark and, and, and weighted toward Hillary Clinton in terms of endorsements in 2016, and, and Donald Trump is our president. So, so what I take away from it is that I would but I'm right when I say that our most effective use is, is to focus local. Um, no, uh, uh, kidding. Uh, I think that Trump presents a unique case, a particular, uh, 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 he, he was just so unusual in terms of a candidate or, or uh, uh, you know, he scrambled some positions that, you know, traditionally Republicans Republican presidents advocated for, you know, X, and he came along with a whole lot of Y in some cases on trade and uh, entitlement program spending, things like that. So there was there was a little bit of a scrambling where even editorial boards, I think, that might normally have been uh, Republican friendly, uh, if not strongly Republican, might have struggled uh, to to endorse him, and and frankly, you know, based on character issues as well, and and you know, suitability for the office. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's probably too a little too neat to say, well, here were the numbers, so therefore there's no value in presidential endorsements. But um, I think for I, I think what every newspaper editorial writer should or editorial page editor should ask himself or herself is. Is, is there something I can bring to my readers on this that will be useful to them? And, and the answer may be yes. I mean, in, in North Carolina, you know, Peter may have come to a very different conclusion than I would have that, that, that there were some North Carolina specific issues that he could elude his readers on the presidential race. I, I just didn't feel that way um, and couldn't think of anything. But, um, but I think that if, if newspapers want to make a stand and say, this is how we feel about this and here's why, more power to them, but but yeah, they shouldn't expect at something as high level as a presidential race where readers are just inundated with information. There's so much out there, uh, uh, even in you know popular culture about the candidates that that you you better come with something that that they can't get anywhere else. 
Peter, what do you think? You, you know, I, I think what Ryan says is really true. Um, and, and I think that as an editorial, as editorial boards, we write editorials for a lot of different reasons, but two of the biggest are one, we wanna have a, an impact on an issue. We wanna influence people, influence the discussion. Um, but also, you know, sometimes we know we're not going to do that. And we know that um, the value of what we bring is just to add a perspective. Uh, and I think that with a, with a presidential endorsement, you know, no, we're, we're not going to have a particularly large impact on, on any voter. They've, they've probably made up their minds about, about um, the race a long time ago. Um, we'll have much more impact on, as Ryan said, um, local house races, um, open seats in which voters don't have much knowledge about candidates, you know, for us, judicial races. Um, yes, we have much more of an impact there. But on a on a presidential race, or in this year for us, a Senate race, you know, our hope is and our goal is that that we can bring something to the, to the discussion that that, that people haven't considered. Um, so when we write those editorials, I don't think of it as much in terms of impact as I do just kind of uh, broadening the discussion. So I, th I think after a while, some of the presidential endorsements, if you're reading all of them, there's a little bit of a sameness to, to many of them. A lot of them are making similar arguments. They kind of start to blend together after a while. But each campaign season, a few stand out for a variety of reasons. Um, this week, there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that the union leader in New Hampshire endorsed Joe Biden after endorsing Republicans every presidential election for more than a century. Um, USA Today endorsed Joe Biden this year in their editorial board had never made an endorsement in the presidential race in the history of their newspaper. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine, who knew that they made <laughs> endorsements, but they did this year for the, for the first time. Um, we saw the New York Times endorse Joe Biden and then come back later and devote an entire opinion section to making the argument for why Donald Trump should not be reelected. Um, Peter, I'm interested in whether any of those endorsements kind of break through in this moment, um, you know, whether any of those stand out to you or whether you've seen any other endorsements that, you know, kind of stand apart from the rest. So, yes, I grew up uh, 20 minutes from the Manchester Union leader, so uh, I was surprised to see that. Um, that that for New Hampshire um, is, was, was a, a particularly impactful um, endorsement, and I think nationwide, too. I think that, you know, when, when the headline was, you know, uh, union leader uh, endorses Democrat for the first time in, in 100 plus years. I do think that speaks to a larger, you know, a larger movement, a larger momentum, at least among editorial boards, but I think uh, about more more so than that. Uh, you know, it's interesting when we did not endorse Cal Cunningham um, in, in the US Senate race, the, the headline on social media was Charlotte Observer doesn't endorse Democrat for the first time since 1999. So, so I, I see, I think people see these uh, endorsements or non-endorsements in terms of, you know, larger trends. New England Journal of Medicine never endorsed a candidate before. USA Today, I don't believe, had it, had actually issued an endorsement of a Democrat. So, you know, so I do think the value is, is that it becomes part of a larger thing. Uh, and I do think that has some impact. So Ryan, you were at the Dallas Morning News in, in 2016 when they broke their own streak, when they, they endorsed Hillary Clinton, was the, which was the first time in decades that they endorsed, um, uh, was it the first time in decades or the first time ever that they'd endorsed a, a, a Democrat? Uh, I think back to LBJ. Okay. I think, yeah. Yeah. And so LBJ that, was a Texan, so there's an asterisk on that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That they were grading on a curve there because he's a Texan. Um, so so the Dallas Morning News was one of the newspapers that people were talking about in 2016. Maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about that. I, I know you weren't on the editorial board, but you lived the experience and uh, and also interested in, in whether any presidential endorsements have, have stood out for you this year. Yeah, so with the morning news, actually, the probably the more relevant experience was that of my wife, who at the time was on the uh, the audience engagement team. So the people that had to, among other things, field emails and Facebook comments and tweets and and whatnot, uh, 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 complaining, and uh, uh, they were busy. There was a, there was a lot of feedback to that to that endorsement. Um, I, you know, at the time, as the guy who was in charge of news coverage, I, my, my main goal was just to say. Right or wrong, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, I think they made the best case that they could. Um, I also, since gaining a little distance from that, as I've taken that as a really good example of, of why it would be best those kinds of papers to focus, uh, you know, more locally and regionally, and and 
notably the morning news did not endorse a presidential candidate for this year. Um, I, the one that jumped out at me was, um, I think it was a couple of years ago, like well before the campaign was on, that, uh, was it the Orlando Sentinel, I think, that, that wrote, we, we can already tell you that, who, you know, the, the, our endorsement is for not Trump in 2020. And I think they wrote this in 2017 or 18. Um, it was a little gimmicky, but it was also a, a, a way to, st to say, you know, to take a very strong stance, which is that, you know, in their minds, there was nothing that he could do to redeem his presidency at, at that point. Um, I, I think that the the Times thing, the time, the Times um, uh, endorsement in the in the primary was uh, really noticeable, um, as I do think it is somewhat different for states where, you know, the New, New Hampshire is a perfect example. Of course, New Hampshire newspapers should endorse for president because they have such an outsized role in determining who the nominees are. So at least in primaries, they should. Um, but the, when the Times endorsed uh, either Amy Klobuchar or Elizabeth Warren, it really, to me, it punched a hole in the whole uh, thing because, because it, it sort of suggested that, um, it, it, it sort of suggested a, a cheap way out, if you will, that, they, that, that, that they, they, they liked both candidates, but ultimately couldn't pick one. Um, and, you know, that was a, a tightly contested uh, uh, primary at the time. And I think that the Times readers really probably looked to them for guidance on, on that sort of thing. So it was a, you know, it, it, as Peter and I have both said, we, we often, you know, we'll take the measure of a candidate who we aren't endorsing and, and, and sometimes say, you know, really good things about them, uh, even though they don't get the endorsement. And in this case, it was like, well, okay, so you like two of them, that's fine, but choose one. Um, and, and I think that sort of highlighted the the way that endorsements can be ineffective, uh, unfortunately, in that case. So I want to make sure that we leave uh, time for audience questions. If, if folks do have questions, um, go ahead and start typing them into the YouTube chat, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to those next. Um, but uh, so just to kind of follow up, Peter, on something you said about um, you know kind of the element of surprise, uh, you know, and folks noting that that you know this was the first time that the Charlotte Observer hadn't hadn't endorsed a Democrat in that race since whatever year. So Brown University a while back um, did a study of endorsements and, and found that endorsements can change people's opinions, um, but they found that the effect is limited if the endorsement is expected. And, um, and so I thought that was an interesting finding and um, just interesting to kind of think about what endorsements we've done that we think have an impact and whether it's something that has surprised our readers or whether it's something, you know, I'm always interested in the fact that sometimes some of the endorsements that do the best are kind of obscure ballot questions that are super boring or super complicated, but um, readers really can't find that information somewhere else. And so, um, you know, my, my, my mother-in-law will ask me, you know, what, does, <laughs> what is this ballot question? And, you know, how should I figure out how to vote on it? And, you know, we're one of the few sources that can provide information on that. So I'm, I'm interested, Peter, in, in what in endorsements uh, in just in terms of broad categories or specific examples you think really have an impact. You know, it's funny because the, the endorsement, the race that I get the most calls on every single election is at the bottom of the Mecklenburg County ballot and it's the soil and water conservation district commissioner race. And it's essentially an educational position. Um, uh, it's a PR position for, for uh, soil and water. And, and it is, and, and, but that's the one that people will email and call me about the most because it's the one they know the least about. Um, a close second would be any judicial race. Um, and, I, and I believe that that's where we have our most value. Um, and and that's, what, that's what readers tell us, that, that when, they, when they call and say, when are your endorsements going to be ready? The one they specifically ask about is when are your, when are your you know, the judges race is going to be ready, district and superior court. Um, even Court of Appeals and in North Carolina, the North Carolina Supreme Court races. And that's just because of what, what Ryan had talked about earlier. Um, you know, we do reporting on that, that people don't have the opportunity to. People know how the uh, U.S. Senate candidates have voted, what their, what their positions are and issues. With judges, it's just so much more complicated. Um, it's not that we're going to be writing about judges' rulings, but we're going to be writing about things like approach to the bench, uh, things like temperament, things like uh, uh, vision, um, 
and 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 those sorts of things that that people just can't find out themselves. And so this is one of those places where editorial boards are probably at their most utilitarian. You know, we can do the work and do the research that other people just aren't going to have the opportunity to do, and that's where we can have the most impact. Ryan, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, overall, I'm a I'm a big proponent of state legislature coverage in all forms. I think that um, and part of that's my background of, of having edited a lot of that coverage. But I think that that uh, as we're learning now with COVID and and uh, and questions about the voting process and all of these other things that the, the folks you send to your state capital uh, have some of the most uh, uh, significant impact on on your your life. You know, it's your education, it's your tax. Uh, uh, it's the state's economic well-being based on its uh, its universities. All of those things are, are functions of state government, um, and, and I think it's really important for editorial boards to to um, weigh in not just on on with endorsements of candidates, but also uh, to follow legislative issues and help frame the debate uh, when a legislature uh, uh, goes to work. So I we take those really seriously. We try to. But particularly, as I said earlier, if there's an open seat, um, um, even in primaries where we really try to to evaluate. And again, that's where you're evaluating more judgment and experience and leadership ability and maybe not necessarily uh, a stance on, on issues. You know, if you're interviewing two Democrats running in a primary for a state house here in Texas, uh, they're both going to tell you that they, they think the state should expand Medicaid. Um, so there's not a lot of there's not a lot of light you can shed on that, but what you can do through that reporting is is help explain uh, if you're a Democrat and you're voting in this primary and that's important to you, here's which of these might be more effective at, at getting that job done. So um, big fan of, of legislatures and, and in you know city councils, especially these races where um, regrettably uh, in a lot of parts of the country and Texas is one of the worst, I'm afraid to say, you know, you just don't get a lot of turnout unless it happens to be on the ballot uh, uh, with something else. Most of our local elections, again, this year is different because of COVID, but most of our local elections take place in, in May of odd numbered years. And, and you know, a Fort Worth city councilman uh, person might get elected with uh, seven or 8,000 votes in a city of uh, almost a million people. So I, I think uh, it's regrettable. And if we can draw some attention to those races, uh, that's, that's a good uh, fun endorsement, but also knowing that so few voters are going to tune in on that. If we can shed some light on the choices, uh, hopefully we can be helpful in, in you know, with such a, a small number of, of people turning out. So we have some audience questions and they're fantastic. So I'll, I'll jump to those. Uh, Mark J asks a, a very smart question. Uh, he says, what does an endorsement really mean? That the endorsed candidate is really good or just better than the alternative? Uh, Peter, what does is, what is your endorsement mean? You know, I think the answer is both. Um, uh, sometimes it means that the endorsed candidate is terrific. And, and when we believe a candidate is really strong, we will say so. Um, sometimes it means that it's the, you know, the one who is slightly stronger than, than the other candidate. And we try to say that as well. When we feel strongly that a candidate is terrific, we will say so. Um, when we feel strongly that, when we feel that it is a, uh, it is a really tight call, a really close race. We will say that it's a slight nod. Uh, we give a slight nod to, to a candidate. Um, we won't say, boy, these are two really awful candidates and this is the one we like the least. We don't usually say that very often, um, but you can kind of read read the endorsements and tell what, when we feel strongly about somebody. Right, and I'm interested in your thoughts and I, and I would just add to that. I know some newspapers draw a distinction here um, between, we use endorsement as kind of a shorthand, but some newspapers, um, are very careful to use the word recommendation instead of endorsement um, for some of the, some of the reasons that Mark J is is kind of getting at. Um, so I'm I'm interested in in what uh, what a stamp of approval from the Star Telegram and and from you means and and just kind of how you look at that those questions. Yeah, so we use the the terms interchangeably more than some, but I do think that if you wanted a precise definition, the the more correct term is recommend. We recommend a candidate. We don't. Endorsement may imply that we are um, on board with that person for whatever they do, um, that we're a fan of theirs, and, and we may be, but 
But really what we're saying is narrowly at this time in this election, we recommend that this is the best choice for voters. Um, I, I almost always try to find a, a way to uh, write a recommendation slash endorsement um, uh, that focuses on why the person that we're recommending should get the vote uh, rather than, than focusing too much on why the other guy is terrible. Now, if you're advocating for the defeat of an incumbent, you have to acknowledge that you're, you're suggesting that the voters should fire someone and why, why did they deserve to be fired? What have they done to, to essentially um, deserve that fate? So, um, but, but generally I, I am always looking for um, uh, ways to say, here is, here is why this person would be a good, you know, fill in the blank councilman, state representative, congressman, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, I, I think this, it, it's interesting. I think the language is something that we're, you know, going back to where we started of, of that maybe people don't understand and we could do a better job of explaining uh, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, uh, but um, um, yeah, I think that, that uh, generally I, I'm looking for reasons to say yes to somebody rather than to say no to somebody else. Great. So Mark C, uh, not to be confused with Mark J, asks, um, as some media outlets become polarized, how does a media outlet cast a neutral lens when making an endorsement? Ryan, what do you think about that? Um, I, I would say that all good journalism is fair journalism. Um, and, and what I mean by that is whether you are taking an opinion or whether you are writing with the goal of, of, of uh, Making one side clearly, um, uh, you, you have to engage with the other perspective, and you have to give. Particularly if you're talking about individuals and you're weighing in on their political fate, it's only fair to give them their say and to and to um, uh, build into whatever you're writing. Um, uh, you know their their best case for themselves, and if you think they fall short, why that is. Um, so I, I I think that. One of the challenges we have, in addition to distinguishing our op operations with internally from our news operations, um, is to distinguish between um, uh, distinguish from outlets that are clearly, you know, putting on a partisan cap and and saying, you know, we're on one side or the other. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more of that in in the media. Um, generally, but um, I think we have to say, well, our, our goal is to, is to do journalism on this. And what that means is our goal is to explain, uh, reveal, uh, find information that, that maybe people haven't known before and to put perspective on things for, again, you know, for the reader to decide. Ultimately take this, you know, mix it in with everything else that you read and, and what you think and, and come up with your own verdict. But if we're doing our job right, what we're doing is saying, here's a perspective uh, we hope it's useful and we've tried to be as fair as we could. Peter, how can we avoid being part of the kind of polarized media environment? You know, I, I think that's a, a, a great question too. And I think what Ryan says is really important. You know, ultimately we're, we're not neutral, are we? We're, we're making a recommendation, but I do think that the, the process to which we get there is, is the most important thing. And as Ryan says, that process needs to be fair. We, we're, we're not um, coming to an endorsement and then doing our reporting to justify that endorsement. It's the other way around. We're giving both candidates a fair say. We're doing our reporting on them. We're doing our reporting um, on you know, talking to other folks about them um, and, and then coming to a conclusion. And we need to be transparent about that. And we need to, when we write our endorsements, um, as, as Ryan said, not, we're not writing our endorsements to criticize uh, a candidate unless it's an incumbent that for some reason we believe deserves that, but we're writing our endorsements to give a fair accounting of what their positions are, who they are, what their visions are, and, and then come to a recommendation after that. So I think that you know, to be fair, we just have to be transparent about the kind of reporting that we're doing, the kind of candidates that they are, and, and hope that people can see and understand that. So another audience question, um, Catherine asks, how often do you not give endorsements in more well-known races? Have there been instances you've done this? 
Um, and obviously, Peter, you, you talked about making the decision to not endorse in, in the Senate race. Um, are there other races where you make decisions to, to not endorse or um, whether you just take a pass on the race and not even interview the candidates or, or interview the candidates and decide no one deserves an endorsement? <laughs> So for us, it's a rarity. Uh, I, I can think of only one other time that it happened um, uh, uh, in Charlotte. And I think that that was on a, a city council district race in which um, both candidates were, uh, we just didn't believe they lived up to the standards of public office that we have for public, uh, uh, public officials. Um, but, but we really, this is not, it's not something that we want to do. Um, we, we want to recommend, we want to at least tell people what we think about candidates. So for us, it's, it's just not something that happens very often at all. Ryan, what about you? Uh, well, I've, I've probably, I've never had to be in that position and I've probably skewed the game board that way by choosing certain races um, where I was confident we could make a, an endorsement one way or the other. Um, I think if that ever came up, um, and I actually thought in 2016, looking back on it, a lot of it, it might have been useful if a lot of uh, uh, outlets had had endorsed none of the above uh, in the presidential race um, because the country deserved better choices. Um, that said, you you are not helping a voter who wants to do his or her civic duty and has to go in there and choose somebody or, or one or the other if you don't. Uh, find a way to come to some conclusion. So um, I think that the, the the circumstances under which that would happen is, you know, something exactly like what Peter went through, which is is there is a, a revelation uh, uh, that calls into question character, honesty, um, um, ability to handle a crisis, um, where you know you 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 don't want to endorse one candidate because that candidate doesn't align with your values, or or you don't think that candidate's right for the office, but then the other candidate has disqualified him or herself. That might be the rare case where I would say, I would end up saying, um, we just can't make an endorsement and here's why. Well, with that, we're just about out of time. Um, I love this topic and could go on and on, but I, I recognize that that, uh, that uh, time is expiring. So, but this has been a really interesting conversation. I want to thank Ryan Rusak and Peter St. Ange for sharing your insights I, I should say that you can read all of their endorsements at startelegram.com and charlotteobserver.com. And this is, of course, our final discussion before election day, uh, because we're expecting to have probably more questions than answers next Wednesday. We're going to pause our discussion series for a couple weeks while hopefully all votes are counted and then we will return on November 18th to wrap up the 2020 campaign season and try to answer the question, what just happened? So um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Please come back November 18th. And if your Wednesday afternoons are already booked, you'll be able to find all of these discussions archived on YouTube. And I hope to see you soon for more politics, pandemic and protests from the Dole Institute at KU.